Uh, welcome everybody to today's last session. We're going to do a workshop from uh, two GIS black belts from Esri on multivariate mapping with ArcGIS. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, leave Aileen and Paul uh, the session from here. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, wherever you are. I guess it's uh, afternoon pretty much across the continent. Uh, I assume most of your people are coming from there. Um, so my name is Paul Hirsink. I am a cartographer and a production manager of the Esri Canada's Community Map Program. Many of you already know me. Um, I have over, oh, I don't know what it is, 20 years of cartographic experience now, working both in the public and private sectors, and I've always been interested in maps. Uh, built, I drew my own atlas when I was at the age of 10. And I took a detour for psychology and social work before returning to cartography, and together with my wife, I wrote a book. and. Uh, called Maps and Mapping for Canadian Kids. And with me is uh, Dr. Eileen Buckley, who is a cartographer and has been uh, making maps for over 30 years. Uh, she has uh, uh, taught at Oregon State University and uh, is currently an adjunct professor at the University of Redlands, as well as working at uh, Esri Inc. in Redlands as well. She's the author of Atlas of Oregon and uh, the uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth editions of Map Use, and she publishes regularly to ArcWatch and Arc User, uh, both publications from Esri Inc. And uh, she's with us today, and I think she's done a number of presentations. So uh, please give a good welcome to Eileen. Thank you. So for for those of you who are looking to uh, follow along on the uh, workshop, this is a workshop. Eileen will be stepping through a number of features of both uh, uh, ArcGIS Pro and uh, online in terms of the uh, multivariate mapping. Uh, I posted a link to the chat window right up at the top there to a pro package that contains all the data that we'll be using for this workshop. So feel free to... Uh, Go there and download it, and also feel free to just uh, sit back and watch the proceedings and learn all that you can. So, uh, Eileen, do you uh, mind moving on to the next slide there? I do. That's fine. So, um, first of all, I think what we have is a... Um, question for all of you. Uh, tell us a little about yourself, just so we, we know uh, who we are talking to. Are you a professor or instructor, a student, a cartographer, a JS professional, or other? Just uh, type that into the uh, chat window so we can get an idea of where you're at and how comfortable you are with the technology. <clears throat> All right. Um, doesn't look like we're getting too many responses yet, uh, but in any event, let's move along, uh, uh, Eileen, because uh, we do have a lot of content uh, to cover, I believe. Uh, so can we move on to the next slide here? All right. So we're getting a few responses. I keep forgetting that the uh, presentation is a bit delayed. Um, so uh, we've got some GIS professionals. We've got some uh, actually, a lot of GIS professionals, uh, mapping technicians, cartographers, uh, uh, somebody who is an ARC Info Pink Belt Pro Newbie. That's you, Roger. Of course, you put something like that in there. Just moving to Pro. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Pro is an excellent package that we've got going here. Um, and uh, you'll find, uh, I think you'll find as we step through the uh, um, uh, workshop that you'll find that there is a lot to cover here. Uh, so today, of course, we are talking about multivariate mapping. Um, and the uh, we've got a page up here uh, talking about, that, that comes from the University Consortium of Geographic Information Science GIS Bullage, uh, Body of Knowledge, and I'm going to post a link to that. Uh, there is a lot there in the text there, and there is a lot in that page or that site uh, that you might want to refer to. Um, so I'm just posting in the ch uh, chat box here, so you, that link should show up. 
But um, if we can, yeah, so this is just basically a summary. Of course, so you're all G, uh, GIS and cartography professionals. You are all, I'm, I'm sure, no doubt familiar with multivariate mapping, but essentially we are basically uh, mapping more than one variable that may or may not be causally related. Uh, and the idea behind that is that we want to do that, put that on the map so that we can uh, see uh, patterns uh, develop uh, over the landscape. Um, and it's, it can get fairly complicated um, depending on the number of uh, um, variables you're referring to and how you're displaying that. Uh, so this, I think, is um, a useful uh, uh, thing to spend some time on over the next two hours um, and uh, I think actually uh, if we can move on to the next slide Eileen I think we have uh, for those of you who are uh, I think uh, actually John Nelson has spoken at one of the uh, Canadian Cartographic Association conferences uh, for those of you who know John he is a cartographer also working with Ezra Yank and he does a lot of incredible stuff. Uh, he has his own blog page, and he writes also for the Esri uh, blog as well. Uh, and we'll post those links for you at the end of this session. But uh, here is John Nelson himself, and uh, he speaks quite well. So we're going to turn it over to John and let him talk about the uh, multivariate mapping. Uh, so I think we've got a, what, 10-minute uh, video here? Mm -hmm. All right. Take it away, John. And we don't have any volume there, Eileen. Okay, so that is a problem. That is on. Um, bear with me one second. I think with uh, Zoom, when you share your screen, you have the option of sharing sound as well. So, Thomas, are you share, still on the oh, line? I've Do you got have it. any thoughts nope. on it? Oh, there we go. Okay. I think I've got it. Okay. All right, let's give it a go. We're giving it a go. Mm, yeah? It sounds weird and bizarre. All right. So, let me pause. Let me pull it back. And we will start again. And here we go. Hey there, thank you for joining me. Today we're going to talk about bivariate and multivariate maps. Bi bivariate maps? That sounds intimidating. It's not. Mm, it sounds weird and bizarre, and it can be. It definitely can be. It doesn't have to be. Let's check it out. Here is a bivariate map showing fires and population. Bivariate. Bi meaning two, variate meaning variables two or more variables all at once. And when we say multivariate, you know, that can mean bivariate. So two or more variables. But why would you even make one? To show perhaps a relationship between two or more different phenomena. So here I'm showing the relationship between instances of fire and where people live. Check out this example. So this is from the mid 1800s. It's wind and ocean currents in the Gulf of Mexico. Isn't this crazy? So clearly this is somebody who is taking multivariate mapping to its extreme. You know, multivariate maps aren't new. There is nothing new under the sun. It's all been done before. And in this case, they did it all in one shot. And this illustrates a pretty important factor, which is cognitive load. How much information can fit in somebody's working memory at one time? Are you just throwing too much at them at once, as is probably the case here? Well, that's up to you. How much can you get away with? How simply can you design it? Um, how trained is your audience? That sort of thing. So for example, this requires a legend that looks like this. I mean, check this out. Uh, the little dot and the direction and the shape of its light scatter has to do with what kind of wind it is, how gently or strong the wind is. And it goes on to say what direction the wind was blowing. Was it blowing this way all day or part of the day? The length of the arrow has to do with how strong the current is. So you've got that visual dimension tied to data. 
there is color. I mean, it's using color here. Unfortunately, it's not using color in the actual legend. It just uses the words. Even the fact that the line is solid or broken means something. Now, honestly, you would have to be highly trained and very familiar with how to use this map, but this is a pretty extreme case. So let's, let's take a step back and just build one up from scratch. Here is a map of the 48 contiguous states of the United States. And we're using a graduated symbol to represent total population. But now, is this a bivariate map? Kinda, right? We're using two symbol dimensions representing two different phenomena for states. And the other data happens to be the proportion of the population that drinks to excess. So excessive drinking, and then that state's overall population. This is one way to make a multivariate map or a bivariate map. This is a pretty simple way because you're just showing a layer twice stacked up on top of each other. Here we are applying that coloration to the graduated symbols themselves. So now truly we have a bivariate map. So this is a bivariate symbol where color represents the proportion of the population that drinks excessively and size represents how many people live there in total. Here's another example. This one happens to use the percent of the population that smokes. Drinking, smoking, this is all pretty interesting stuff, so I'll use these as examples. The percent of the population that smokes. Uh, lighter areas have a lower proportion of people who smoke, and darker areas have a higher proportion of smokers. This is just one dimension of data, but not all counties are the same, right? You, you might have counties where 10 million people live or so, and one county where a few hundred people live. So maybe we can reduce the opacity of those lower population counties. So now we have a bivariate map showing rates of smoking, but it's pushed back in transparency for population. Low population areas are more transparent. High population areas are more opaque. This is called a value by alpha bivariate mapping technique. And you see it a lot for election mapping, because that's also an important consideration, of course, is how many votes happen in a place, not just which way they voted. So here's a simple map showing, once again, rates of smoking, but we're just using monochromatic color scheme here, grayish blue to a, a deeper blue, rates of smoking, more and less. Here is uh, rates of excessive drinking, more to less, so gray to pink. Now you can, you can calculate where people smoke and drink, or where they smoke and drink very little, where they smoke a lot but don't drink a lot, etc. And you can create a bivariate choropleth map, or a relationship map. And you're showing two dimensions of data concurrently. This takes a little bit more horsepower in your mind to actually understand this. In this case, I might rotate that legend slightly to connote the fact that darker mixed colors mean more and lighter mixed colors mean less. The area on the left means high rates of smoking and little drinking, and the area on the right that's very pink is high rates of drinking and very little smoking. Pretty crazy, right? Well, let's, let's segment this out into little groups. Here are counties where both smoking and drinking is really high via the dark blue mixed color and where smoking and drinking is both very low via that light gray. So this is where these two phenomena are correlated with each other. They are both high or low uh, evenly with each other. Conversely, we can, we can pick apart areas where there is a, di a dichotomy between these two phenomena. Where do people smoke a lot but don't drink? Where do they drink a lot but don't smoke? That's pretty interesting too. We're looking for relationships. Sometimes there are relationships and sometimes they aren't. That's why Multivariate and bivariate maps are so fun. Speaking of fun, here's another map. This one shows the preference of beer versus wine in people's spending data. This is a bivariate map. So preference uses color and overall spending uses brightness. And we don't, we aren't stuck with color coding everything, right? It doesn't have, we don't have to break out the crayons every time. Can we use different symbol types for multivariate maps? Sure. Here's that same exact data. We just happen to be using little, they're called churn off faces, little cartoon faces that give you an indication one way or another of your data. A little kind of a guy who might look like he likes wine more than beer and then how sober are they versus how drunk are they represents overall spending. You can get really creative with this. Sky's the limit. Here's another example. This time we're using the preference of college basketball versus professional basketball. And then we're doing a value by alpha approach and dimming down counties with low population and leaving bright areas with high population a bivariate map. And again, here's another way of doing that. Instead of color coding, we're using graduated circles. Some places watch a lot of both. Some places watch a little bit of both. Some places have a disparity in what they prefer. Now here it is given a slightly altered 
symbology instead of two rings that may overlap each other and cause some issues why don't you show half a ring and say the left side is going to be college basketball and the right half of the ring is professional basketball i'm just showing you this because there are tons of ways of making a bivariate map literally a kajillion so we had all those rings sometimes they're overlapping. What if we just offset the rings so they don't all overlap with each other? We can grow and we can shrink them, but you don't get the problem of occlusion. So this is using happiness data, different factors of happiness. Now, how do you have a legend for something like this? It's pretty complex. I've got six categories of happiness and they're color coded and they're surrounding a center point at various angles. This legend also shows you the fact that if it's smaller and closer to the center, then people aren't very happy in that regard. If it's larger and kind of blown out and blooming, then they are more happy. It's kind of a complex thing. Here are a handful of other examples. We've got um, all these little complex multivariate symbols showing you these six happiness indicators for every country. Am I really going to remember what all these stand for? When you have a symbology like this, it's best to reveal it narratively. Uh, so, for example, I would show this in a story map. And I would say, hey, here are the symbols. By the way, this is a key for what these colors mean and all the attributes that they represent. And I would start zooming in on specific areas and talking about where one phenomenon is more than another anomalously. Or I would um, highlight one aspect of this versus the others and then bring them all back to you. I would guide the reader through this so they weren't just kind of uh, left to figure this out all by themselves. And, um, you can walk them through it. Narratively is an excellent way of presenting a multivariate map. Sometimes it's your only prayer. If I didn't have the opportunity to walk somebody through this via a story map or something, I could use a legend like this. So I think of this as a for instance sort of legend. The legend itself decodes it for me. It shows me a couple of extreme cases where everybody's happy in all categories. Nobody's happy in any categories. An extreme case where everybody's happy except for one factor. And then perhaps a little wordy version of that. Multivariate maps are inherently a more complex thing. So speaking of lots of colored rings, here's an example where I said, ah, forget it. I'm just going to stack them all right up on top of each other. The result is at each location, you've got a pretty complex multivariate symbol, a growth ring, or a little bit like a tree ring that shows seasonally the appearance of tornado activity in that area. It's color coded by month and it's scaled by uh, is there less or more tornado activity in the area. It's interesting and it's, it's sort of attractive, but it's not terribly practical. So what are some alternatives to multivariate maps? If uh, you have a lot of visual factors that you want to communicate to somebody and you don't necessarily want to make a multivariate map, what can you do? Well, you can just animate them. So here we are showing all of those months one at a time. And the sequence appears to move and you, you start to see, okay, there's like this wave of energy that rolls across the United States in the form of tornadoes and sweeps up and down, up and down the Great Plains of the United States every year. Another alternative is a small multiple, a simple layout that shows all of the instances individually. Your eyes can dart and make whatever connections they want. This is a small multiple. A small multiple might be a viable alternative to a multivariate map. Speaking of lots of colors, look at this multivariate map with lots of colors. What's going on here? This is, you could say it's a trivariate map. So in the world of printing and graphic design, people think in terms, color-wise, of CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, which is usually black. And it's a way of mixing inks together to create any color possible using these four component inputs three if you only count CMY, which I am. So I've tied the relative amount of cyan to the percent of the population that smokes. The relative amount of magenta has to do with the percent of the population that is obese. And the relative amount of yellow has to do with what percentage of the population are excessive drinkers. How do you make sense of something like this? Even graphic designers will have some issues really wrapping their mind around this. So what do you do? You label the map directly. There's no reason that you have to let the legend do all of that work and all of the heavy lifting. And maybe you can't put it in a story map. 
show the data and then describe areas of punctuated examples where there's a lot of something or a little bit of something or interesting relationships. So interesting relationships, that's the name of the game when it comes to bivariate and multivariate maps. Well, I hope that was interesting. I hope it was helpful. Gives you a sense for what's possible. Like I said, there's literally a kajillion different multivariate maps that you can make. Stick with me, and I'm going to show you in the next parts how to make some multivariate maps in ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Online. Stay tuned. See you there. Okay. So first we're going to talk about multivariate mapping with ArcGIS Pro. Paul, can you hear me okay? And the slides are good? I can hear you fine. Everything is running smoothly. Wonderful. Okay, so in Pro, the mapping method is the first thing you'll choose when you change the symbology of a layer. This is something you select on the primary symbology pane. ArcGIS Pro has a lot of mapping methods that you can choose from, including commonly used methods such as core pleth mapping, which is called graduated colors, and proportional symbol or dot density mapping. You can also use bivariate colors, which is the same as bivariate core pleth mapping. And you can show your data as charts on maps, or you can summarize your continuous quantitative data using a heat map. For more complex symbology like military map symbols, you can use a dictionary. So let's take another poll. We'll look in the chat window for your responses. We want to know how familiar you are, familiar you are with the symbology options in ArcGIS Pro on a scale of 1 to 5, with 1 being unfamiliar and 5 being very familiar. So if you take a minute, let us know. If you're not familiar at all, type in a 1. If you feel, feel real comfortable with the, um, the symbology options in Pro, go with a five. I would say if you feel okay about most of them, not okay about a couple of them, go with a four. Or if you feel okay about a couple of them and not so great about the others, go with a, a two. And so so it looks like we've got uh, quite the range here from uh, one to, oh, we got a four to five. So uh, all those people are, looks like, uh, Three to four range, two to, we got a lot of number ones. Uh, so yeah, quite a mix there. So um, well, quite a variety in our audience. Awesome. And our pinked out Roger Wheat has a 2.5, so smack in the <laughs> middle there. <laughs> awesome. Well, keep feeling, feel free to keep responding. Uh, I think we get a good idea that we're talking to a range of users, which is perfect. That's how we've set up this presentation today. And if, so, I, if I can just jump in there, Eileen, uh, for those of you who have questions, as Eileen goes along, feel free to put them in the chat window at any time. Uh, we'll be stopping about halfway through to answer your questions, but uh, do put them in the chat window as they come up, and we'll deal with them uh, when we have the opportunity. Perfect. Okay, so um, in ArcGIS Pro, the primary symbology you choose may inherently be multivariate mapping method. For example, if you choose bivariate colors, you're prompted, of course, to use two variables. And if you choose dot density mapping, you'll be very clearly given the option to choose more than one variable to display on the map. You can also create multivariate maps using the second tab on the symbology pane. This tab gives you the option to vary symbology by attribute and to allow symbol property connections. This means that you can use other attributes in your data set to vary certain aspects of the symbols. If you choose to vary symbology by attributes, the things you can vary will change depending on the primary symbology method that you have selected. For example, if you're using single symbol, then you can change the transparency of the color based on an attribute. But this is really pretty much the same as using graduated colors. Um, so if, if that's what you want to do, it's probably better just to select that symbology method. On the other hand, if you're using graduated symbols, you can also change the transparency, rotation, and color. Now this might be useful. For example, imagine you're mapping weather data collected at points. You could use an arrow as the point symbol and size to show the wind speed. Those are defined as parameters of the graduated symbols themselves. Then you could use vary symbology by attribute to set transparency to show visibility at the location, 
rotation to show the wind direction, and you might even want to use color to show the temperature. But the, even though the combinations of things you can map into a single symbol is not really a limiting factor for multivariate mapping in ArcGIS Pro, as, ta as John pointed out, the more you load onto a symbol, the less it may be understood. So let's take another poll. We'll look in the chat window, and we're just looking for a yes or no answer. You may already have been aware of vary symbology by attribute, but do have you already seen or worked with allow symbol property connections? Yes, if you've seen or worked with allow symbol property connections. No, if you haven't. And we'll watch the chat window to see what your responses are. I'll go backwards a couple slides while you're doing that to show you that the option is on the second uh, tab of the symbology pane, and it is this option at the bottom called Allow Symbol Property Connections. Uh, looks like we've got a lot of no's there, Eileen, so uh, we're going to have to share uh, what we know about the Allow Symbol Property Connections to the crowd. I don't see any yeses, so this looks like a new thing for people. Well, I'm going to admit right now, in, in honor of full disclosure, that I didn't know much about it either until John introduced me to it in this next video that we're going to be watching. So let's take uh, a look at this video to see John show us some of the kajillion ways that you can use ArcGIS Pro to make multivariate maps. Oh, well, welcome back. In the previous video, we covered the crazy world of multivariate and bivariate mapping and how you want to know how to make them in ArcGIS Pro. Well, I'll show you how to make some of them. There's an infinite number, infinite number of multivariate maps that you can make. I'll show you some of the ways that I use ArcGIS Pro to make multivariate maps. Ready? So here we are in Pro, and I'll be using the UN's happiness data. The data is from 2017. I don't know if a whole lot's changed in happiness since 2017, other than the fact that everybody would be unhappy now. <laughs> anyway, here is a simple, uh, let's look at the symbology, a simple graduated color look at the World Happiness Index, coding the fill of all of these polygons. Lighter areas are less happy, self-rated, by the way, a, a survey that's sent out to people, and more happy for dark green. What's this little gear here? Check this out. I want to show you this. If I click this, there's a little checkbox that says apply to fill, but you can also apply to the outline or outline and fill. That's really cool. Let me turn this off. This is essentially a million copies in this demo of the same data. So I'm trying to isolate the variables and just showing you one data set, a million ways to make multivariate maps. So here we are where I have applied the color coding to the outlines of these polygons. That's kind of interesting. The reason I'm showing it to you in a multivariate or bivariate map demo is because you could use a layer that used fill with one data and then color the outlines by something else entirely. And now we have a bivariate map showing two different data sets. Now I have to admit, I don't really see maps like this and it's kind of confusing. So let's turn this off. Instead, let's take a look at just the typical fill. Now this is still color coded by the happiness rating, but let's try something called a value by alpha. I'll open the symbology panel, and we've got graduated colors for happiness, just like before. But there's this really interesting little green box over here that when I mouse over it, it says very symbology by attribute. And you might be asking yourself, well, wait a second, isn't that what we're doing here in the primary symbology tab? And the answer is yes. If I had my way, this would say very symbology by even more attributes. Let's see what it's got. Transparency and outline width. That's kind of interesting. Let's look at transparency. You might use transparency to fade out places of low population, perhaps. I have an attribute called unexplained. Maybe you have some uncertainty values in your data that you want to merge into your visualization. How strong, how certain or uncertain you are, you could use opacity. And you can change these values. So very uncertain, I'll make highly transparent. I always have to think about transparency. And then very confident places, I'll make 0% transparent. You can also drag these 
uh, the slider range along an interactive histogram here. My, my data is actually plotted along this histogram, which is pretty neat. And maybe you want to fine tune it or exclude some outliers. You can drag this manually and reposition the bookends of this linear opacity gradient. And you can, you can show uncertainty in that way or a population or lack thereof in this way. So that's a value by alpha technique. Let's move on to graduated symbols. Not all countries are equally sized, and some very geographically small countries have a lot of people. How do we treat that a little more fairly? Well, you could try using graduated symbols. Now, graduated symbols just represent an attribute via a scaled up graphic. In this case, we're just using a simple ring, and it's automatically placed at the center of our area. And if I zoom in, you can we can kind of declutter that a little bit. Everything has its own trade-offs, you know. Uh, if, I, if I zoom out, I've got a lot of overlap and it can be very confusing. If I'm using a different scale, maybe this would be a useful technique. But again, this is just one variable. And I've got lots of attributes in this data. So this is just showing the happiness index for each country. But there are actually six constituent parts of this data that talk about different ways that people can be happy, different happiness drivers. So let's take a look at those. Maybe I wanted to show them individually at the same time. What kind of a world are we living in if this sort of thing is possible? Well, let's see. Turn this off. We'll open up this. And we've got six categories of happiness. One of them is income. So we can do a graduated symbol by income and duplicate our layer and change it to another attribute. In this case, it's trust in government. And I'll use a different color, a different color for health expectations, a different color for social support system, a sense of freedom, and giving and generosity. How much do you give to charity? These are things that people think contribute to a sense of well-being and happiness. And we have six attributes here. We're showing six variables concurrently. This is definitely a multivariate map. Is this a good multivariate map? I would say no, it's not a very good multivariate map. It's interesting visually, but overall we, we've got some issues understanding this. We also have to deal with that whole issue of cognitive load. There's so much going on here. You need a pretty complex legend to explain this. And even still, a map reader would struggle really grasping this. And even if you're really looking at it and studying it, you might not be home free because you've got problems of overlap. The rings might be very similar in value to each other and stack up. Occlusion is where one thing covers up another thing. And it can be a real problem in cartography, particularly 3D cartography. Let's take a look at an alternative. I'll turn this off. Let's just imagine if... I have multiple rings, but each ring, I've simply offset it in a certain direction so that when we show all of these graduated symbols at once and then unify them with a little hub and spoke graphic to help visually track this as a single cluster, we've got a pretty interesting multivariate symbol happening here. It's uh, like a ring of happiness or a bouquet of happiness. The different colors and directions correspond with the different happiness drivers and their relative scale compared to each other is low happiness or high happiness. Now, is there any way that you can make a complex multivariate symbol like this without having to just stack up tons and tons of layers? Yeah, of course. Really, we're just making a weird, bizarre chart here. So why not just make use of actual charts? ArcGIS Pro lets you use charts as symbols. So if I right click and choose the symbology for this, I can see a bar chart. Each country has a little bar chart. The height of each bar has to do with the relative strength of that happiness variable. Pretty interesting, right? And bars are good because the human eye and mind are pretty adept seeing the comparative height of something and understanding it in a comparative quantitative sense. We're less good at understanding volume as they compare with each other and area as they compare with each other, but we're really good at comparing the heights of things. Um, there's also a stacked bar chart option, which I've turned sideways, which looks kind of interesting. And all of these bar charts are just available as an option in this primary symbology. And lastly, we'll look at pie charts. Yes, you can map pie charts per feature. And each feature is showing me six individual attributes and then one cumulative overall additive attribute. So this is an interesting method for making multivariate.
Now here we are back with our standard graduated symbol. I want to show you something pretty interesting. So you've seen me use this very symbology by attribute tab, but this is a point feature and there's a couple more options here. So uh, we've got transparency. Let's take a look at color. If I drop down color, I can choose another attribute. And in this case, let's say happiness index. And now I'm mapping size for the happiness index and color for the happiness index. I tricked you. This is not a bivariate map. This is actually kind of the inverse of a bivariate map. This is a symbology type that's showing you redundant cues. Two visual dimensions are corresponding to the same attribute. If you really want to drive something home visually to your audience, use redundant cues. They don't have to um, spend a whole lot of mental horsepower figuring this out. Bigger and darker means more. Smaller and lighter means less. Redundant cues, so applying two visual dimensions to the same bit of data. But let's talk about bivariate maps again, okay? So we'll pick a different attribute here. This time we'll say to what percentage income is estimated to have an impact on uh, happiness. Now you've got size corresponding to overall happiness and then color corresponding to something else. And you might have some um, anomalous things happening here, and that's why it's so interesting. You could have large happiness, but they don't really care much about income. Or you've got um, quite um, low happiness ratings, but as far as income is concerned, that, that's not the issue in this location. Those are interesting comparisons to make. Interesting relationships reveal themselves. And it's very easy to just pick different attributes here. In this case, um, very large happiness scores might not necessarily correspond all that much to having a strong social support system, a network of friends who you can count on. That's interesting. I'm going to show you baked-in intentional method of bivariate mapping available in ArcGIS Pro. So with this polygon layer of world happiness data, instead of single symbol as my primary symbology, I'll pick bivariate colors. There's that word, bivariate, two variables. I pick this, and immediately something interesting is going on. We pick two fields. So let's take a look at, well, it's already selected this for us. So income, so GDP is income, and then social support system. Countries that make a lot of money are pinker, and countries that have very strong social support networks are bluer. And where they're this kind of dark purple, there's a strong instance of both of those, of both of those things happening at the same time. Um, so you make a lot of money and you've got a lot of friends, I suppose, or you can trust your friends. In the light areas, you don't have a lot of money and you don't have a very strong social support network. Pretty interesting, but especially interesting is the places where you've got high income but not many friends, so pink areas. Conversely, you've got areas where you have a really good social support system, but not a lot of money. It's like a Crosby, Stills, and Nash kind of song. Okay, I want to show you one last multivariate trick. This is easily the most multivariate of them all. It's bananas. If I select my graduated symbol layer, and we'll go back to our trusty old very symbology by attribute tab, down here at the bottom is a little checkbox called allow symbol property connections. Allow symbol property connections. What does that mean? Well, when this is checked and I dig into my template symbology, Every visual component can be tied to data, and you get these cute little add data connection icons, the offset distance, the rotation angle, size, outline width, color, fill color. It's amazing. So let's just play with a crazy idea. We'll tie outline width to data. Instead of just being a standard one point, it can be data driven. So we'll choose its happiness ranking, and if we hit OK, there's some really thick outlines. That's OK. We can modify this formula with an expression builder. And I'll reduce its size by 100. Isn't that fun? There's just no end to the ways of multivariate mapping. Well, that was a lot of maps. Too many maps? I don't know. Can you have too many maps? It was a lot of variables crammed into individual maps. That's for sure. Well, I hope you learned a few things. I hope you're interested in trying out some of these techniques, and I'd love to see what you come up with, by the way. Now, stick with me because in the next video, part three of three, 
I'm going to be showing you different ways of making multivariate maps in ArcGIS Online. Yes, on the web. See you there. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to give you a heads up right now that we are not going to be showing his third video, but all you have to do is go to YouTube and search for John and search for multivariate maps, and you will find that third video. And it's wonderful, too. But um, we wanted to focus on a few different things in this workshop for you. So, But let's keep going with ArcGIS Pro. Let's talk about, just in general, about creating multivariate maps. So when you're creating multivariate maps, there are a number of things to consider. You'll want to think about which variables can or should be combined or compared. And to de determine this, you could explore relationships among the variables in advance using, for example, spatial analysis or scatter plots or other types of visual analysis. Then you need to think about the best way to map each individual variable as well as the best way to map combinations of variables. Also, any assumptions about the mapping methods themselves must be met. To explore this a little further, let's look at bivariate choropleth maps. Arguably, the most common thematic map type choropleth maps do two things. They show overall geographic patterns, and they make it relatively easy for map readers to identify specific data values. Also, because they're so common, they're likely to be more easily understood by map readers who've seen them before. The term choropleth comes from the Greek terms choro for area or region and plethos for multitude. This means that choropleth maps should be used to show quantitative data within aerial units. Choropleth maps can be used when your data are related to areas like counties, zip codes, or health service areas, are standardized so they don't show counts or amounts, and represent a field rather than an object such that all locations have a value. For example, diabetes prevalence from the 2020 county health rankings data is defined as the pr present, uh, percentage of adults age 20 and above with diagnosed diabetes. These data are related to aerial units, the counties. They're standardized as a percentage, and they represent the contiguous U.S. as a field. For all choropleth maps, there's an assumption that data values are homogeneous within the areas. That means that the value for an area such as a county relates to the entire county. And abrupt breaks can occur at the boundaries between areas. This might be related to variations in the uh, population, the politics, or other factors. But it could be related to the way that the data are collected within the areas. In an optimum situation, the aerial units would be of relatively equal size and similar shape. This ideal situation would be the case if we were mapping a Midwestern state, such as Iowa or Kansas. <clears throat> but if we're mapping all the US counties, there's a large variation in shape and size. And in fact, the largest county is 10,000 times bigger than the smallest county. Finally, there's a set of important and interrelated relation, uh, decisions to make when creating a choropleth map. In ArcGIS Pro, you're guided through these decisions by the interface. So let's see what that looks like for bivariate colors symbol. First, you select your two variables of interest. Then you're immediately prompted to normalize them. The classing method defaults to quantile, although you can change that. Um, but for bivariate choropleth maps, the quantile method is often recommended, so you're looking at the same proportion of high and low values in each distribution. For example, the top and tw bottom 25% if you're using four classes or quartiles. The grid defaults to 3 by 3, although you could choose 2 by 2 or 4 by 4. For choropleth maps that show a single variable, a rule of thumb is to use no more than seven classes, depending on the hue. Keep in mind that for bivariate choropleth maps, the number of classes is the total number of colors in the grid, which for a three by three grid is nine. That's already starting to push the limits. 
Well, let's take a few minutes to explore the bivariate color scheme options in ArcGIS Pro. We can categorize these by the types of distributions for which they should be used. Almost all of them are appropriate for distributions in which the values for each of the variables range from low to high or vice versa. Taking a closer look at the color schemes, we can see that three are clearly different. These schemes are appropriate for distributions that are diverging diverging, qualitative sequential, or diverging sequential. All of the color schemes relate directly back to the color brewer color schemes. It may be helpful to note that there are no qualitative binary or diverging binary color schemes in ArcGIS Pro because the grids have to have the same number of rows and columns in both the X and Y dimensions. Finally, it might be useful to note which color schemes are colorblind friendly. There are three sequential sequential color schemes and one diverging sequential color scheme that fit this bill. That said, it is possible to modify the colors in any color scheme. In the upcoming demo, I'll show you how to modify the colors in a bivariate color scheme. Note that you can also change the transparency of the colors and you can rotate the array, which will impact which colors are assigned to which data values.